<laughs> good morning, uh, Carrie and Brian and Shannon. Um, good morning. A little bit of early chit chat, some Q and A. So I'm going to throw a lob ball at Carrie that came in. What to what financial situations do you add the most value? What are your best referrals for you? So we'll start um, off with uh, an easy one. We'll give the hard ones to Brian. Okay, as long as we're gonna give the hard ones to Brian, I'm perfectly fine with that. Um, honestly, um, I like all financial situations, quite frankly. Um, if, But I like it when I can be creative, especially when we're getting into settlements. Sometimes there's confliction in what... Uh, each lawyer is saying, and I love it when we can get creative with our um, our settlements so that the family like kind of both feels really satisfied and, and find that really great acceptable agreement. I think those are a lot of fun to do. Um, I like because they're a little meaty and get into it rather than just as a bank account and that sort of thing. Um, so honestly, I like all referrals. Um, it's fun to have the really big meaty ones and it's and the creativity and having to get in there and dive deep. And sometimes you need a really nice, simple file, which I'm still waiting to get 10 years later, still waiting to get that really nice, simple one. But I, honestly, I love them all. I am excited to do it, each and every one. I'm excited to work with the families. Great answer. Actually, this one came in. It's not quite collaborative. It asks um, updates with spells of support where once where with the spouse working full time to be self supporting where the other parent has the kids full time but is paying the ex spousal who is working full time. Uh, is there a chance for spousal support to end well that's not totally on topic but supports usually based on need and ability to pay so if the recipient spouse no longer has a need for support, you can certainly use collaborative practice methods to get it reviewed. What do you think, Brian? Uh, absolutely. It just depends on the if there's an agreement in place or a court order, what that says as, as to whether it's something that can be uh, reviewable. And, uh, uh, and uh, then you just are looking at their incomes at the time after when you're considering a, a variation of it. Yeah. Quick and follow up. That's a great that's a great one for a collaborative case because yeah. uh, um, the court system is so backed up and, and uh, inefficient right now that uh, it would take months and months to get something like that yeah. uh, before a judge and uh, um, it, you know, you're better off just to go the collaborative route and get it resolved sooner rather than later. Follow up for you, Carrie, 30 seconds or less. What is an example of creative negotiation? Oh, being creative, um, basically um, kind of melding both sides of the law together to come up with something creative. Um, I'll give you an example. We have competing um, thoughts about what should happen with a cottage that was an inheritance. And one side is saying it's a mat home, the other side is saying no. So we're getting to be creative where we're saying what part of this can we say is inheritance and then can we look at something with the, the organic growth. So it's looking at different ways of like just taking a fresh perspective and maybe just applying the law isn't always the best way to do it. Sometimes we just need to get creative. Legacy cottages are always um, a really tough one for families. Shannon, uh, one o'clock, what are we talking about today? We are doing an introduction to collaborative divorce. So um, I just want to first of all welcome everyone and just say a special thank you to Carrie and Brian for joining us today as panelists. And thank you to everyone who is joining us today in the audience for introduction to collaborative divorce. So we have Russell Alexander, Carrie Heinzel, and Brian Galbraith today. I'll go into a little bit more of the introductions after. Um, uh, first of all, going over some housekeeping and letting you know what's on the agenda today. So first of all, um, just as we are presenting virtually today, we do apologize in advance for any technical issues that may come up, but I will be available throughout the presentation for any questions or tech issues if you are having any challenges throughout the webinar. You can contact me at shannon at russellalexander.com and I'll do my best to help resolve the issue and I'll make sure to put my email in the chat for your reference as well. So on the agenda today in this one hour presentation, Russell, Carrie, and Brian will be sharing their insights on collaborative practice covering the following topics. 
we have what, what the heck is collaborative practice, collaborative practice training, the CP participation agreement, the roadmap to success, neutrals, the power of a full team, your first meeting, impasse, reaching a settlement and debriefing. And we'll also, um, there will be some, I'm sure the panelists will be answering some questions throughout the presentation, um, but we'll also have a designated Q&A portion at the end of the webinar. So if you haven't already, please feel free to submit your questions via the Q&A box, and we'll do our best to get to those throughout the presentation and during that Q&A segment. Um, and just a note, um, we just want to ensure to keep everyone's identities anonymous. So you'll notice that the chat function has been disabled, but you can send those questions in anonymously through the Q&A box. And we also just ask you to please keep in mind that the content of this webinar is to provide you with general information on separation and divorce and should not be considered as legal advice. And just another note here is that I'll be providing the links to helpful resources mentioned throughout the event in a follow up email tomorrow so keep an eye out for that. So without further ado, it's now my pleasure to introduce today's host from the Greater Toronto Area. We have Russell Alexander, Kat, Carrie Heinzel, and Brian Galbraith. So first up here, we have Carrie, who is the founder of um, Fairmore, Fairmore Family Law <laughs> Financial Solutions. And Fairmore offers independent fact-based financial analytics and settlement insights to individuals and couples working through separation and divorce. Carrie is an active collaborative process trainer, co-teaching the introductory program for new collaborative professionals and advanced level trainings for the seasoned practitioner. And Carrie has taught statistics, research methodologies, and psychology at college and university levels. In addition, Carrie has presented at conferences for the Ontario Association of Collaborative Professionals, Family Dispute Resolution Institute of Ontario Annual Conference, and the International Academy of Collaborative Professionals. Next, we have Brian, who is a collaborative family lawyer, mediator, and trainer, and is also the owner of Galbraith Family Law, which has offices in Toronto, Newmarket, and Barrie. He has 15 associate lawyers in his firm, all of whom ha have been trained as collaborative practice family law lawyers. And Brian is the incoming president of the International Academy of Collaborative Professionals, and he has taught workshops at the international level for IACP and the American Bar Associ Association and locally for the Law Society of Ontario and the Ontario Bar Association and collaborative pa practice groups everywhere. Brian also completed his master's degree in law in 2016. Russell is the founder and senior partner of Russell Alexander Collaborative Family Lawyers, and with over 20 years of experience, Russell offers a wealth of knowledge and expertise in collaborative family law. He uses his experience with a client-focused approach by creating unique solutions for each of his clients to enable them and their families to move forward with their lives in a compassionate and collaborative manner. So now that you know a little bit more about our panelists today, I'm going to pass things over to Russell to get started with the presentation. Thank you for those kind words and introductions, Shannon. The, um, we love polls. We, we, a lot of the feedback we get is that the, our audience members really like the polls. So please participate in the polls. They're anonymous. It helps us understand who our audience is. We also really appreciate any feedback that you have. <clears throat> so Shannon, like she, Shannon indicated, she's going to send you a follow-up survey any ideas for future programs or what we can do to do better, uh, please let us know. You're going to get some show notes. So we're going to refer to a lot of documents and a lot of information and some videos that's going to be included in the show notes. So if you want to do some additional research into collaborative law, you're going to have a link hyperlink to all that. Um, but and we do have a dream team today, like Brian's great. He's tempor temporarily off the screen. Carrie's fantastic. But are we in a position to offer our guarantee? Shannon? No, you know we always do, Russell. <laughs> <laughs> so for anyone, we hope you all enjoy the webinar, but for anyone who's not satisfied, we do offer a money back guarantee for our free webinar. <laughs> okay, so we're off, right? All right, so let's see, uh, first poll, why are you joining us today? Um, going through separation and divorce. Oh, here we go, here are results. Separation and divorce, 18%. Legal professional, 56%. Other professional, 18%. Want to learn more to help a friend or loved one, 6%. And other, you can put the other in the chat box. And um, we'll, Shannon will let us know what the other is. So we have one more poll, just because we love polls. And then we're going to get into the substance of this. How much 
do you know about collaborative practice? And while we're doing this, Paul, let's go to another audience question. Um, so here's one for you, Carrie. How do you get the reluctant spouse on board? Oh, wow. Um, how do you get the reluctant spouse on board? Well, you know what? There's a lot of different methodologies I know that uh, each one of us have used in our practices. Uh, sometimes using the neutral is a great way. You've gone to your legal counsel, you've retained, you want them on board for collaborative, you're not sure. And sometimes it's writing a letter so that their spouse can look at that letter. Uh, you're writing it to your client. Another way is to have them go to the neutral and have that neutral bring them in and explain the process to them. Uh, sometimes that can be a little less intimidating, um, but there's a, a multitude of different ways. I know, Brian, uh, you have some great ways of bringing the reluctant spouse in as well. Well, the, the most important thing is to uh, have a conversation with your client be because they're the ones who know their spouse the best. You don't know them. And so you, you need to take, a lot of lawyers will do, or uh, other professionals will have a, a consultation and they'll talk about collaborative practice and their client is on board, but they don't uh, make an effort to come up with a strategy as to how to approach uh, the other spouse. So sometimes it's uh, helpful if they have some real big concerns around parenting to get them to a, a family professional who's neutral and the family professional can uh, explain collaborative practice. Uh, sometimes it's you know just getting them to a, a collaborative practice website. In the old days, we used to do a letter to the uh, reluctant spouse. And I, I tell you, that wasn't as very effective. And so Another strategy we use sometimes is we write an email to our own client uh, describing the process and we customize it based on the concerns and issues and worries of, uh, of the, our own client and also on the uh, concerns that the other spouse might have. And then that your client can share that with their spouse and somehow that's less intimidating than uh, sending a letter directly to the other spouse if, if, you, if they share an email that's written to them. So there's lots of different things. Most important is to have a conversation with your client about how best to approach their spouse. Let's see our poll results. That's a great answer, Brian. The old days are like 22 months ago, right? Handing out a brochure oh, yeah. of a of a practice. <laughs> like that, that's the old days. Um, so how much do you know about collaborative practice? Nothing at all, 22%. Well, you're in the right place. I, I heard a little bit, but I want to learn more, 42%. Well, again, you're here, you're in a great spot to learn more today. Currently in the process, 3%. I've done collaborative files, 14%. That's good to hear. And other. So Brian, what the heck is collaborative practice? What are we talking about here? Thanks, uh, uh, Russ. Uh, collaborative practice is a fantastic process. And uh, what it is, is a way to resolve your divorce and separation issues without going to family court. And uh, people, some people think it's only for those super amicable couples, and that is not the case. We can deal with high conflict, complex cases, uh, because we work together as a team. Uh, there's one lawyer for each client, and then we work with a financial professional who helps look at the financial issues, and then a family uh, uh, specialist or family professional who helps with both the emotional journey of the clients, which can be huge, and the uh, parenting issues and communication issues, uh, and the, the family professional will help develop a parenting plan. So it's really great because you get the experts uh, in the room to help you with your, uh, your issues, including the, the lawyer to finally turn it into a legally binding agreement. And what's fundamental about collaborative practice is that everyone signs an agreement that says they're not going to go to court. And if the matter ends up in court, uh, both parties have to uh, get new professionals. So. That's a wonderful thing. I'm gonna talk more about the participation agreement in, in a few minutes, but it's, it's a really wonderful element of collaborative practice 
because all of the professionals involved in the case have a deep personal commitment to helping the parties reach a settlement. Because if the matter goes to court, they're out of a job, right? And so uh, we as lawyers and family or financial professionals, we don't want to lose our, our clients. So we work really hard to uh, help them come to a settlement. And uh, because of the team nature of the process, you can deal with some really uh, contentious uh, divorce issues and work them through uh, to, to a resolution through collaborative practice. Uh, but even the simpler matters, we can just do it so much more with a team uh, approach, just really, really well. Yeah, uh, you know, it's um, the training is what they talk about a paradigm shift, right? When you say, okay, I'm going to make the commitment, I'm not going to go to court, I'm going to work outside of the court system. So I think we may have a poll coming up here. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see what we have next. Sure, why not, right? <laughs> let's run this poll. And we have a funny picture while we're running this poll of Stu Webb. Uh, I don't know if we could do both uh, walk and chew gum at the same time. Can we get our <laughs> poll question up there as well? So thank you. Who is Stu Webb? Well, Brian's going to, I just want to show this is uh, Stu and I in Seattle in 2018, but I'm not going to do it justice. So Brian, 30, 45 seconds or less, tell us about this character on the right. Well, Al Stu Webb was the man who uh, created the collaborative practice movement. And he declared uh, January 1st, uh, 1980, I think it was, that uh, he was uh, uh, no longer going to go to court and uh, he was going to only do uh, collaborative cases, but he was the only one. He did uh, um, ask others to join him in, in movement. And the reason he started this he had just participated in a really uh, long, I think it was a six week trial over custody matters. And uh, at the end of the trial, he felt like he was hurting the family instead of helping them. And he said, you know, either I'm going to find a new way to practice family law or I'm going to do something different. He had a background as a pharmacist. So that was one of the things he was thinking of doing is going back to pharmacy because he did not want to hurt families any longer. Uh, and so, um, so that's what that's what he did. Litigation will cause you to medicate, that's for sure. Uh, <laughs> let's see the answer of our poll question here. Thank you, Shannon. How has the pandemic mm -hmm. impacted your client's experience and decision making regarding separation and divorce? 14% no impact. Only 6% has decided to avoid court. Surprise, because courts were shut down for a while. Delayed the decision, 11%. More research, 11%. Increased stress or conflict. Yes. Well, I'm on a webinar. What all our clients are telling us is that stress and conflict have gone through the roof during the pandemic. Unfortunately, uh, it has led to more separations and divorces. I know Brian's firm has grown significantly. So have we. So that is certainly a, a big impact that we've had. All right, so collaborative practice training. You guys want to become collaborative practice lawyers. Is there training? How do we go about this? How do we learn more? Brian, can you help us out with the training? I know both you and Carrie are trainers. I've helped you coach on several yeah. sessions. You probably have trained over 50 people that I know since the pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, so what's this involved, Brian? Well, uh, collaborative practice training uh, in Ontario is uh, very sophisticated now. We've We've got a, a, an agenda that all of the trainers follow. And uh, in the old days when it was in person, it was five full days of training. So at the end of it, you feel like you really can practice uh, in, in, uh, collaboratively and you can follow the process. The well, old we, days, the 22 pandemic, months ago. <laughs> it's not that old, but it's just 22 months ago. That's what we're referencing. Right. Uh, and we uh, we had to pivot when the pandemic hit and we started to teach our program uh, online using Zoom. And uh, we love it actually as trainers. And we've had tremendous feedback from the students that they've really enjoyed it as well uh, because we, we spread it out over uh, multiple days. We Our training now is uh, 
eight sessions uh, of about four hours each. And uh, it's all on Zoom. So people love it because they can continue to practice for the other half of the day. And uh, they don't have to travel. They don't have to pay for hotels uh, and food restaurants, food and so on. So we're finding uh, there's a lot more interest in getting the training done now. And there's more interest because the court system it has really been negatively impacted uh, by uh, the pandemic. And there's so many delays in court that uh, it's, it's uh, you know, just not a really viable option for people. And so we're finding professionals are seeking uh, training so that they can uh, jump on board with collaborative practice. Gary, what do you think of the training? What can you add? Sorry, it's my bad. You probably should have taken the lead on this. One, so <laughs> that's that's I'll take right. ownership for that one. It's all good, Chris. Never a problem. You know, the thing that about collaborative practice training is it's not just for lawyers. And it's really important to stress that everybody that's a professional within a collaborative team is collaboratively trained. So all of our family professionals, they are collaboratively trained and all of your financial professionals are also collaboratively trained and they take the exact same training as legal counsel. So everybody's learning the exact same principles. They're learning the exact same process that we're going through so that we all, we wanna make sure that everybody, and you've alluded to this already Russ, has made what's called a paradigm shift. So it's that idea of taking away a combative, uh, this is all about me and I'm against you To We are looking at a very holistic approach in which what we wanna do is we want to help this family move forward to the next chapter. There's still going to be a family. It doesn't matter that the mom and dad are separating, there's still a family. I always say the best part about doing it collaboratively is that you kind of get a roadmap when you when you had kids? Don't be you didn't still get my roadmap. Don't be still my roadmap. I love your roadmap. It's one of my favorite things. <laughs> but it's that idea that when we had our children, when I, I don't know about you guys, but when I left the hospital with my daughters, they didn't give me an owner's manual about how to raise them. And the wonderful thing about doing collaboratively is when we have a family professional, they're actually teaching the parents how to co-parent. They're yeah. getting that roadmap of what to do next. Your, the separation agreement becomes this wonderful kind of owner's manual or guarantee of, oh, okay, we don't know how to do this. Let's just go to the manual and find out. It's about the family and it's not just about one individual and we want an acceptable agreement at the end of that. Great stuff. Let's run our next poll. I don't, do you remember the movie, The Guardian with Kevin Costner? And they talk about the training they go through, but what's great about it is they can work with any team. Mm -hmm. throughout Same idea. People throughout North America, if there's a disaster, once you have your collaborative practice team, you can work with anybody really in the world. Yeah. Your collaborative files. We've all had the same training. We're all following the same principles. Most of us have a standard practice agreement. So that's really the benefit of it. You may work with somebody completely new, but they've been trained and they're familiar with um, the process. So poll four, because we love polls here, what is your <laughs> biggest barrier to collaborative practice training? So let's take a look at our results and see what our audience is saying here. Cost of the course. Yes, I've heard that. Um, mm -hmm. Surprisingly, when you do the math, the trainers don't get paid very much money <laughs> given the amount of time they put into teaching the course and preparing the materials. Um, they, trainers would make more, I think, in their professions than doing the training, but uh, it, it's certainly not a profit center for trainers. It's just a lot of time and a lot of energy goes into the training. Time away from work, uh, 7%. Well, once it's done, it's done, right? You're trained. It's just one of those licensing requirements. Not really interested, 7%. Don't know what it means to be to do collaborative. Well, hopefully you'll learn more today. Don't know where to sign up. Well, in our show notes, Carrie and Brian are offering a training session, I think, what, four or five weeks down the road? Something like that? Uh, we're uh, March. So just right. the week after March break is when we're doing our next training session. 
So for the 33% interested in signing up, you're going to get a link today if you want to sign up with Brian and Carrie, Bev LeMay's fantastic team member that they work with. Uh, I have a bad singing voice for Kumbaya. Well, we did play the Rolling Stones and we were talking about the 60s today. So everybody's welcome. Thank you for your results. Um, so what we got, the collaborative practice participation agreement. We're re relying on Brian Heavy at the front end um, and we're gonna turn to Carrie. Don't worry, we're gonna carry a chance. So Brian, uh, the participation agreement, what are we looking at here? Yeah, uh, first, of all, first of all, there's one in the show notes, but what are we talking about? Well, the participation agreement is a contract that is signed uh, at the very beginning of the process uh, by both parties, both the uh, people, the clients, clients, and signed by their lawyer. And says how we're going to solve this. And it says, look, first to court, and we're not going to threaten to go to court. We're going to work to get a solution that works for both of us. And in fact, it says uh, that uh, the professionals involved in the case cannot go to court with any of the parties should the matter break down and, and not be successful. And let me tell you, um, uh, what our training partner has done over 500 collaborative cases over her I have three cases that did not settle uh, most almost not I think it's around 90 so Brian, that's not Brian, a worry Brian we're just having yes, a little sir. bit of uh, audio issues on your end so uh, Carrie you want to just wrap up the participation agreement in uh, a minute or less and we're going to circle back to Brian in a minute or less, basically the participation agreement is the idea that you're agreeing that you will not go to court, that you will use the collaborative process and principles to reach an agreement. Should you not reach an agreement, um, what you can do is you would leave the collaborative process. So you would have to wait 30 days and then you could start any other process that you like, but you kind of lose what uh, you've done within the collaborative process. The idea is the collaborative process is set up so that it is a full focus on problem solving and resolving the issues of the family. And um, everybody, including the professionals, has something at stake if it doesn't move forward and resolve. Yeah, and like Brian said, it's a written contract. So let's go into our next poll question because I love the polls and we're gonna do some audience <laughs> questions that are coming in here. Uh, which is great. One question is the cost of the training, Carrie. You know the the cost off the top of your head. Uh, I believe it's uh, nineteen fifty or eighteen fifty plus HST. I can't do anything about the HST. Um, that's for that's, ten half days. That is for eight half days. We've shortened the training time period from from five weeks, which was ten sessions, down to four weeks at eight sessions. And that's, that's a business expense, right? You're training yourself. A hundred percent. Another one, as a potential client and concerned collaborative lawyers charge an even higher rate because they have additional training. What is your suggestion for keeping costs down? Well, we're going to talk about working as a team. My experience is collaborative lawyers are probably a lot less expensive than litigation lawyers. Uh, the additional training is just factored into um, their hourly rate. So you don't get paid at an addition, you don't pay an additional fee because they did additional training. Let's see what else we can get in here quickly. Um, is the process available if the case has already been in court for years? Um, well, we have a program called Runaway Train uh, that Carrie and I and Jared Johnson have done <clears throat> where we talk specifically about taking high conflict cases out of the court system and using collaborative practice to settle those cases. We have a advanced collaborative pro, um, introduction live event, January 12th. We're gonna talk about run a tr runaway train in that uh, session and get into some details in terms of how do you take court cases out of the existing court system and do them collaboratively. And great questions coming in here. It's hard to mm -hmm. keep up with them. Um, if Shannon could put a link into the chat box for the training, that would be great. <clears throat> um, and let's see what our poll results are. And 
lots of great questions coming in. Thank you for all that. All right, so what's your largest roadblock to using a neutral? We're gonna talk about the role of a neutral in a minute. Loss of revenue, 26%. Won't know what to do with my spare time. 11% <laughs> can do it better, 5%. I'm, in, I'm a control freak, need help. That's a tough one, right? Especially for lawyers. You're, you know, some lawyers, their business model is to do the, the work the neutrals would do, or they want it to be perfect and they can't delegate. That is a really hard one for some people to let go of and bring in a team member to help it. What is the neutral? 47%. So I think we're going to talk about neutrals right now. And it's 1227. We're exactly on time. So Carrie, the floor is yours. So the floor is mine. So what is a neutral? So a neutral is a person like myself as a financial person or your family professional are both considered neutrals, meaning that we work for both parties. We are not advocates. Um, in my role as a financial neutral, I'm gathering documentation from both sides. So if Russ is one of my lawyers and Brian is my other lawyer, instead of them collecting all of the information and fighting over, or uh, well, I won't say fighting, we're just like uh, aggressively discussing <laughs> um, how things should be um, for a net family property for settlement, I'm getting all of the documentation together. I'm putting it so it's one agreed statement of fact. Can I just um, stop you there, Carrie? Yeah. You know, for lawyers, this is the dance, right? We send off letters for disclosure. We disagree with outstanding. We go to court. We have a motion. We blow off five grand in our client's fees to have a, a judge make a disclosure order. And this is sort of the merry-go-round of litigation. But you stop all that, right? A hundred percent. Stop all of that. And you save, you save, you're saving money because you're doing it for both people. Well, the nice thing about like using neutral. Like your expense and you're just presenting it to the, your report yeah. to the team. Yeah. So they're sharing an expense. So it's cutting down on their fees of going through any process. So what's well, ending up. paying two lawyers, their hourly rate to send a document, their own document briefs to disagree what's there. They're paying you a lesser rate to do it jointly and submit it to the collaborative team. Exactly. So right the off I, the bat, you're saving several thousand dollars. Oh, immediately. And the yeah. idea is that you have the right professional doing the right job. Yeah. Lawyers are not trained to do financials or to do parenting plans. It's not their role of expertise. Whereas your family professional, parenting plans, communications, those are their expertise. Uh, financial professionals is our area of expertise. And so you've got the right person doing the right job for the right price to come up with the best possible agreement. Again, it's about being family focused and we're putting our clients first. I love it. And, you know, the analogy I would use is the lawyer's role is sort of the general contractor. <clears throat> You're building this house or mm -hmm. managing this divorce and you bring in these sub trades to help you out, right? A family professional is going to be much better at screening clients, domestic, screening domestic violence, focusing on parenting plans. Financial professionals going to do the NFP, the financial statements, get all the pension valuations, and then they bring the work to the lawyers and you work as a team to sort through it. So I think it's great, but that's a nice lead into our next subject, which is the power of full team. Brian, you ready? Yeah, the, the, the advantage to having a full team is that uh, you have the, the right experts in the right seat able to help with uh, their expertise. So, so uh, the, full I, team, I, the full team would be a lawyer for each client, right? Or each parent. Yeah, and, and, and uh, yeah, and the uh, financial professional who does all of the, looks at all of the uh, equalization and property issues and support issues and the family professional who helps develop the parenting plan and deal with the emotional journey of the clients and help them around communication. So, so four, I, four I, I might- four, But it could be even bigger depending on what issues you're dealing with, right? Yes, yes. Sometimes you might have a, a, an expert such as a business evaluator come in to help mm -hmm. uh, determine the value of a, of a business or to determine the income of some for support purposes of someone who is self-employed. Um, so you, you, or you might have someone help with uh, pension valuations, an actuary, or 
or various people like that. Sometimes we can even bring in a mediator uh, into the collaborative process when necessary if, if the parties have reached an impasse. So um, mm -hmm. it's really great as a, a family professional, as a lawyer. Oh, we had him for a minute there. Now we've lost him again. Uh, he's like, uh, I, I feel like I got to slid him because he's president so, now, right? So I don't want to <laughs> interrupt the president, but we got a great question that came in while we we're um, and the does the collaborative approach work for spouses who live in two different jurisdictions? Carrie? Yeah, absolutely. I know I, Be Bev LeMay, she does Zoom uh, family professions for a lot of families up north because of the distance. But you could do it across the country or in different countries. I've actually done one where the clients lived, they were Canadians that lived in Las Vegas. Yeah. Um, so I, it's been everywhere. I've done a couple from Florida, um, you know, um, some people in BC. It, you know what? It, it, with the Zoom platforms and being able to do things virtually, we've now eliminated any kind of, of restrictions on space. We can now help our clients from anywhere around the country, um, I, really around the globe. It, it's what works best for all of us. Um, two, two quick more questions and we're gonna go into our next slide. Uh, Gary, so do you create the NFP and financial statements? Yes. Where do TBVs enter the picture? So, uh, of course you do. I've seen them. They're fantastic. But sometimes when we need to get a business valuation done, and that's uh, we'd bring in somebody to help with that. So just just to let people know, there are forty seven different uh, disciplines of finance. So, and anybody that says they're an expert in all of them is wrong. Um, my expertise is in separation and divorce. That's where my expertise lies. I don't, I am not a business evaluator, so I will recommend a business evaluator. And I have a, basically a corral of them where I sit there and go, I know this business evaluator is really good at valuing this type of business because they're not all created equally. It goes back to that general contractor analogy, right? There's a trade or a specific valuator who can help with that specific issue. We've had cases where it could be international tax issues. Mm -hmm. uh, we've had cases that involve corporate restructuring. Yes. And we're concerned about triggering an audit. So we've brought in corporate specialists to help with that, tax specialists. So it, depending on, it depends on the issue. But one more quick question, um, and then we're going to go into the first meeting. Are there neutrals that can assist with domestic violence? It's your family professional. Yeah. A hundred percent. That is your family professional. They are the expert. Back in the old days, that used to get screened out, right? Domestic yeah. violence cases. And now there's lots of families, including, unfortunately, families exposed to domestic violence. That uh, Collaborative is probably better suited. You go to court, many people feel like they're getting victimized again when they go through litigation. Uh, Absolutely. So let's, talk, let's talk a little bit about the first meeting. The first meeting. So we, now we've got the participation agreement signed. We've got our mm -hmm. professionals on board. Uh, we might have a full team. So the timing of the first meeting is important. Um, mm -hmm. Certainly, you're going to want to have a professional's call with the other lawyer and the other professionals that are getting engaged. Um, a lot of the time before we before I have a first meeting, the professionals will work with the clients offline, even before the first meeting starts. So that could be something as simple as developing an interim parenting plan. They're mm -hmm. not going to sign it. They're going to present it at the first meeting. It'll be discussed. It could be as simple as getting some initial financial information. So at the first meeting, may, we may understand there's some pensions that need to be valued and the forms to be ready for to be executed at the first meeting. All the first meetings are gonna have a, an agenda that the professionals agree to in advance and it's based on the roadmap that we're gonna talk about in a moment. There's a certain pace to these meetings as well. So mm -hmm. we don't wanna overwhelm our clients by going too quickly and some clients want it done yesterday. So you gotta be mindful of the pace and you wanna manage your client's expectations. Usually the first meeting We'll get some work done, and depending on what the neutrals have done, we'll sign the participation agreement, or sometimes it's signed in advance. 
and then we'll deal with, deal with immediate issues and some longer term issues such as uh, disclosure of pensions or things that are going to take some time. So you want to make sure that your client doesn't think everything's going to be settled at the first meeting. It's likely going to take one or two, maybe even more meetings, depending on how, how sophisticated the issues are that we're dealing with. So that's how I approach first meetings. Um, let's go to our next poll question because we haven't done a poll for a while. <laughs> See what our audience is thinking. So poll, num poll number six, what is the best way to deal with impasse? Oh my goodness, this is such a great poll question because we're gonna talk about it soon. Um, and there's, Carrie, we're getting tons of questions into the chat here. Okay. Uh, Fantastic questions. Uh, all right, here's here's one. What if one party doesn't comply with the signed agreement and there's no written option to go to the court to obtain it to go to to get the, an agreement? So, I guess the question here is: Okay, well, we have a, an agreement mm -hmm. in the collaborative process, and they're not complying. What do we do, Carrie? You know, there's several things. I, I don't ever want to say we just end the process. Um, we usually what we'll do, in the, and this is where your neutrals can be of great help, we try and get them to kind of move into compliance and letting them know what they're risking by having to go to court. So sometimes it can be a misunderstanding, and I've seen that a few times where somebody said they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing, yeah. but it's leaning on your professionals. So it's about having a full team meeting, a full professional team meeting first, addressing what the issues are, and then saying, who is the best person to deal with this? So if it's on the financial side, they're not getting documentation in, then myself and that person's legal counsel, we will have a meeting, the three of us. If it's a family issue, the family professional and that lawyer will have a meeting. We try and bring them back into the fold before we just go, well, that's it, we're done. The pots and tools we can use. Two more quick questions, and then we're going to go to our poll results. How much does the collaborative process cost the parties? Is it shared, or is it based on income of the parties? Well, the general rule is the neutrals are shared, and the clients pay for their own lawyers. I've had cases where I knew my client was going to be required to make a significant equalization payment, and the wife had, had no money. So we advanced funds for her legal fees and to pay for process and to give her some independence. Uh, those fees were subsequently adjusted at a later date when we knew what the final numbers were. So I would say generally fees are shared equally. What's your experience been, Carrie? Yeah, generally uh, the neutral fees are absolutely shared equally. Um, they are paying for their own legal counsel. What a lot of people get concerned about is how do we keep doing this? Like, how do we pay for all of this? Nobody plans for a divorce. Nobody stocks money away for that. So usually what I tell people um, for our clients is if you have a line of credit, both of you are, and you have a lot of room on your line of credit, both of you use the line of credit to pay your legal fees and to pay your neutrals. It's a great way to keep track of the cost of the process on your own but also it gets easily reconciled at the end um, by the financial neutral. I've found that clients that do this become really interested in, in being cost, con cost conscious. And also at the end of it, they can say, you know what, we, we did all of this together. We're in a better spot than when we started. Maybe what we do is we just split it completely because we got to the end. Yes, your lawyer might've been hundred dollars more an hour than mine, but at the end of the day, we got the same results. And so let's just divide it equally. Right. And I've seen that happen quite a bit, actually. Yeah. And um, Brian has done some great work on block fees for the whole process. Mm -hmm. We're not going to get that into that today, maybe in our advanced topics where the family pays one fee and that gets them, uh, the entire collaborative process paid for, including two meetings. Last question uh, quickly, Brian, I hope your audio is working. And, I, and I'm sorry that I scrolled over this question earlier. Wouldn't it be best to ask the reluctant spouse why they're reluctant? Brian, are you with us? Wait. Yeah, absolutely. That is a great question to ask them to, to find out, you know, what is their biggest concern? Uh, because once you understand their biggest concern, then you can explain how collaborative practice uh, addresses that concern. So, uh, you, you know, it, it, 
there's a lot of reasons someone might, might be reluctant. And one of them is that they probably don't trust their spouse, who's your client. Uh, and so they think that it's some kind of a, a trick uh, to use the collaborative process and that, that it probably isn't in their best interest. So they have a natural adverse re reaction to a proposal by their spouse. So you need to just explore it and um, see what's going on and see if you can uh, find a way to, uh, to address it. Apologize for my uh, bad internet. I, my Wi-Fi has gone down, it's so okay. I'm on my iPad on the cellular and it's not that's, working great. <laughs> that's sort of the wolf in sheep's clothing, right? Everybody's concerned maybe this person is using this process for an improper purpose or to delay. All right, so let's take a look at our poll results. The best way to deal with impasse, cancel everything, go to court, 4%. Well, that's certainly an option, but not what we're advocating today. Dig deeper into goals and interests, 25%. Break it down, see where the main sticking point is, 50%, 7%. What is impasse? Run, hide, and pretend it didn't happen. All right, so let's get into impasse. Brian. What are we talking about here? I guess this is when, you know, you hit a wall and we can't agree on a certain issue. It could be parenting, it could be support, it could be any kind of issue, but then you hit this impasse, right? Is that what we're talking about? Yeah, and it's when you're stuck. And, uh, you know, I always tell my clients, if impasse is normal, impasse is, is you, they should expect we'll have a, a moment of impasse uh, because these are tough issues and, that, that they're dealing with and there's no you know black or white uh, resolution that is uh, can be can be um, imposed on 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 it so you you impasse is normal and to be expected but there's so many ways we can get through impasse sometimes it, it means going back to work work with a financial professional or work with the uh, family professional one-on-one -on -one or together uh, you know maybe both parties just need to meet with the family professional maybe it's just reviewing their interests and goals what are what are their biggest underlying worries and concerns and seeing how we can address those in the process and sometimes it's bringing in an outside person like a mediator to uh, give it new energy and sometimes it's just as, as simple as parking the issue and coming back and moving on to other issues. And somehow, miraculously, the, the issue where you were reached impasse becomes resolvable. And I don't know why that is, but often that happens. Just, just leaving it for now, letting everyone sleep on it, dealing with other issues, and then coming back to that, that issue where there was impasse. And that can result in, in finding an agreement. So lots of things that can be done before they abandon the collaborative purpose. And it's normal, right? Usually I find once we hit impasse and get through it, we often quickly settle the case. But I've got some great questions here and it's hard to keep up with them, but um, this one's for you, Brian, because it's a hard one, I think. And it's a difficult issue that lots of us see from time to time. If the collaborative process fails and I have to hire a new lawyer, is the new lawyer allowed to get all the information and case file from my collaborative lawyer. I'm worried about paying my new lawyer money to catch up. So we hear this objection a lot. What, what do you do? How do you deal with this, Brian? Well, it, you know, I've, I don't think I've ever had, I may have had one or two cases that uh, didn't resolve. And so it's pretty rare, but uh, the participation agreement uh, stipulates what information can be shared and that would include, uh, you know, a lot of the original basic financial information that is is shared in the collaborative process and would be needed in the uh, in any litigated process. So that that information will can be shared immediately. Usually, what people do is they'll have a uh, the collaborative lawyer will have a conversation with the new litigation lawyer and and kind of outline um, the areas the of of conflict and uh, where the parties are at. And uh, so it, it, the transition can go quite smoothly uh, in, in from a, a collaborative case to a litigation case. So it, 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 my experience, uh, one of our lawyers had a case that didn't um, settle and it was transferred to a litigation 
a lawyer. There was an, an hour meeting between the two lawyers and they were pretty quick to get up to, up to speed to and move the case forward. Yeah. And it's, it's kind of an, a good thing because you get fresh eyes on the case and sometimes those cases that, that they don't, not able to be settled and collaborative, but they're transferred to a, a, another lawyer and uh, the new lawyer can get it settled even without having to avail the court process. So um, uh, most, but like I said, most cases in collaborative practice settle fully uh, and uh, because of the uh, fact that there is such a deep commitment by all of the professionals to reaching an agreement that is so key you know it, without that exclusion clause without that clause in the participation agreement that says no one can go to court uh, people always have that option it's it's like the Brian you're, cut, Brian, you're cutting out again, but that was a great question and, and a when great answer. The door is open too many times. So, Carrie, I've got one for you. Okay. How soon, how soon after the separation should a couple be engaging with professionals who can help, help with the collaborative approach? I would say immediately, right? There's no, no reason to wait. There isn't a reason to wait at all. You know what, some people need maybe to, to take a beat and, and catch their breath and to understand what they're going through. Uh, like what's just happened with the, the decision to end the relationship. So, mm -hmm. but there's never a problem with speaking to somebody. It's actually, I like the idea of that people kind of go within the week of their, they've decided to separate. You can get into a good process at the right time you know, you you can get parenting issues worked out. Yeah, right? get an interim you, parenting plan going. You can start removing the the fears of the unknown. I find so many clients are just are so agitated and upset with what's happened, which is completely understandable. And then all of a sudden, they get hit with the fear wall, where it's yeah. like, what's going to happen next? I don't know what to do. I don't know what's going to happen, and they get it's really well-meaning from family and friends and co-workers and everybody else because everybody knows somebody that's been through this process but the problem is is that that's what's happened to them and it doesn't necessarily mean that's your experience the beautiful part about collaborative it's basically a concierge service it's yep. about your family and we're going to work on your family Great. not what happened to somebody else's family and thank you for the question. One more quick one. Carrie and I will do this and then we're going to go into the roadmap. Uh, do you have separate individual meetings prior to bringing them into a full team meeting? Mm -hmm. Well, I always meet with my clients. I, you, I think, Carrie, you sometimes meet with the parties individually and sometimes you meet with them together. What's more common? More common is just that I would meet with each of them individually before I would ever meet with them together. I have to screen for uh, power imbalance and domestic violence issues as well. Um, so and we, I, yeah, so we got lots of meetings before the full team meeting, so their clients can be well prepared. So this roadmap, I love this document. It's in the show notes. It's part of the participation agreement. I think it's um, Schedule A, and. Um, Oh, like it's actually a roadmap. So <laughs> <laughs> this isn't what in, what's in Schedule A, but this is even better. So gather and exchange information, identify, well, build the foundation, sorry, uh, gather and exchange information, identify interests, evaluate the consequences of each choice, and then uh, identify what choice you're going to implement. So this is in the show notes. This is sort of I like this uh, this map and this schedule A because it lets clients know where they are in the process at any given time, and how it was what was going to be happening next. So reaching and a settlement, Carrie, we've uh, we've learned, you know, what collaborative practice is. We've mm -hmm. reached a settlement. What do we do next? Reaching a settlement. Honestly, this is now where the, our lawyers get to shine. Um, we, once we get to that, so we do a lot of work, your neutrals are going to do a lot of work up front. And then we get into the middle of it where we start to wean off reaching. Once you've reached settlement, this is all about your legal counsel and that you are writing your wonderful separation agreements. And it's going to be everything that those wonderful meetings have come into. And the idea of that settlement and getting that separation agreement is something that you are both finding mutually acceptable 
when things are mutually acceptable and it's been your decision to make those decisions and how your life and how your family's gonna go forward. There's great compliance that happens with it. And people walk away from the process knowing what's happening next. There's never a what's next problem. So that's the best part. And there may be some loose ends to cover off, like transfer the pensions or whatever, however the equalization is being paid or transfer the home or new wills and power of attorney. So there's some loose ends that you clean up, but the separation agreement is the anchor of the, the collaborative process. And then you can even take that agreement. And if you get a divorce filed with the court, it can become part of your divorce order. Uh Absolutely. One of the things that I like to do with our clients when we're at end of process, we actually give them a, a checklist. So you yeah. finish your process. Now here's your checklist. So people forget to do things like name changes, uh, changing your beneficiaries to match what's going on in your separation agreement, uh, updating schools saying, you know what, here's all the contact information for mom and all the contact information for dad. So we want to make sure that all of those things are checked off. And it's the little things that get forgotten at the end. So yeah. we want to make sure that those are all getting tick boxed away. And back in the old days, right? <laughs> 22, 22 months, months ago. ago, we would have signing, signing meetings, right? So yeah. we have a chance to celebrate, not just for the clients, but for the professional team that, you know, we've managed the file uh, successfully. So uh, we do it with DocuSign and other ways safely, virtually, but final topic, debriefing, and we're going to bring this train into the station uh, and do some more Q&A. Great questions today. Keep them coming in. Mm -hmm. We're going to try to get as many questions as we uh, answered as we can. So debriefing, what are we talking about here, Carrie? I kind of like this uh, subject matter, but what are we looking at? I love debrief meetings. This is where the professional team gets together and says, what went really well? What could we have done better? And uh, what do we want to stop doing? What do we want to keep on doing? I really love this because it helps the professional team really hone their craft. It's also a great way when we're in process for the professional team to say, hey, I noticed this happened when you said X, this is the reaction that the client had. And we want to make sure that they stay comfortable. So debriefing is a really great way that we can continue to tweak the process, that we can continue to improve and make sure that our clients are being heard, that they are getting what they need out of process, but also so the professional team understands completely what their magnitude of work is next. So that's why I like a good debrief. All right, great answer. A uh, couple of quick questions. Shannon's gonna come on in one minute. Um, what with all the professionals, this could get expensive. Well, actually, it saves money, right? You don't have mm -hmm. your lawyer parent doing the parenting plan. You don't have your lawyer doing the financial statements. Many of the roadblocks or impasses that you you'll hit can get red flagged and, and screened for you by the family professional, and then you'll understand why that's a roadblock. Um, do lawyer family lawyers work with other professionals? Can have collaboratively trained real estate lawyers, realtors, yeah, mortgage brokers. There's a whole bunch of people we work with. There's practice groups, there's information in the show notes. We're gonna talk more about that in the advanced program on January 12th. Um, so last one question, and we're gonna get Shannon in here. Great course, okay. So you're doing it electronically, you're worried, you know, the. So a family member or a new, new partner is going to be in the room. Uh, this is always an issue. And we, it's even an issue in the old days, right? We would have mm -hmm. family members in the next room or driving people to the meetings. Two minutes, or sorry, 30 seconds or less. Great chorus. Brian, how do we deal with that? Well, you need to address that concern right up front uh, with your client and talk about it. And and strategize as to how they can be on their own during the, the meetings. And sometimes people will uh, invite their, if there's a real big issue with this, they'll invite their client to have a little signal that will say, say that there's someone you know present. So they might just you know put their hand on their head and that will tell you through the video screen that there's someone present and then you, you uh, can redirect the conversation or end it 
so that you can keep things private. That's kind of one of the techniques that you can, can use. But I've had lots of meetings with clients who are in their car so that they can ensure their own privacy. Certainly uh, one of the perils and pitfalls of all this uh, electronic hearings is you know, the safety and privacy of the process. Shannon, welcome back. A uh, couple quick questions and then wrap it up. What do you think? Sounds good. Yeah, as Russ mentioned, we had quite a few come in, so we're going to do our best to get through as many as we can. But we just want to first of all, thank everyone for your participation and sending in these questions. And thank you to our panelists for sharing your insights. Questions were great. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. Great questions. Great participation. Um, so there's a couple here that came in in advance, actually, um, that we'd like to cover in the next couple minutes. So how common are non-confrontational collaborative divorces? Brian? Uh, oh, well, I mean, it comes and goes. We've, we've seen that there's been uh, an escalation in the level of conflict between parties during this pandemic. Absolutely. Uh, 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 typically, that is the case. But, you know, I've had some cases that have gone uh, just swimmingly well uh, and are, were easy cases because the parties were on the same page. And uh, so that just means that the costs are less and the mm -hmm. time to get it resolved is less. So that, that's great. We can deal with those cases easily, uh, but we could also deal with higher conflict cases with complex uh, issues uh, because we have the team approach. One more or is that it, Shannon? What do you think? Pardon? One more or is that it? You can do one more quick question here. So how do you deal with opposing counsel who does not want to proceed with a full team? Well, you explain that you're going to save time and expense. And, you know, you, you're, it's going to be much more efficient if you delegate to the full team. So what I, for my new clients, I just say four te full teams are normal right? If we don't need a team member, we could drop them off for whatever reason, but we never do because they realize the value of the team. So great question. Thank you for that. Shannon, you want to bring it the train into the station and keep <laughs> us on time? Sounds good. I just want to thank Carrie and Brian again for joining us today as panelists. And thank you everyone again for joining us in the audience. We really appreciate your questions and participation. And we hope that you found the content helpful today. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, um, we will be sending an email tomorrow as a follow up with links to helpful resources. We'll make sure to include the training that was mentioned. Um, so you'll just keep an eye out for that tomorrow. Um, and if you do have any questions or comments about our virtual event series, we love to hear from you. You can contact me at Shannon at RussellAlexander.com. And there'll also be a survey that pops up following the webinar. So please, if you have the time, we welcome and appreciate any feedback you have from today's session. So we can take it into consideration as we continue to grow our series. And we will be taking a brief break from our virtual event series around the holidays. Um, but if you weren't able to join us for Christmas Access earlier this month, we'll be um, offering the recording next week on Wednesday, December 22nd. And I'll be sending a registra registration link to that, as well as a list of our upcoming webinars in 2022, which also includes our part two of this collaborative divorce training. So keep an eye out for that tomorrow again. And we just wanna thank everyone for joining us today. Right on time. Perfect, Shannon. Thank you so much. Brian, I salute you as president. Carrie, fantastic as always. Thank you, everybody. Thank you both. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for the wonderful you. questions today. Thank that you. was great.